thiamine deficiency? Who's at risk? And we talk about, if you ask your doctor, you know, do I have a thiamine deficiency and can you test me for thiamine? The, the, the common answer you're going to hear is thiamine deficiency, that's nonsense. That doesn't happen anymore. That's only in third world countries. That's only in impoverished places of the world or that's only in people who are wasting away or malnourished. And the reality is thiamine deficiency is extremely common even in the United States. Let's break down why. Let's break down who's at risk. You see this also, the same research review paper taken from the same doctors who wrote the book I mentioned earlier, Chandler Mars and Derek Lonsdale. You see here, hiding in plain sight, modern thiamine deficiency. We've got, with an average diet, even a poor one, it is not difficult to meet the daily requirement for thiamine, and yet measurable thiamine deficiency has been observed across multiple patient populations with incidence rates ranging from 20 to over 90 percent depending on the study. This suggests that the RDA requirement may be insufficient to meet the demands of modern living. I think it's important to, for that connotation, modern living, because a lot, of, uh, a lot of people are deficient, not so much because they can't access thiamine from foods that they might eat. They're deficient because of their lifestyles. Let's take a couple of examples here. People who are obese. You see there's a high degree of thiamine deficiency in obese individuals. Here the rate of deficiency ranges from 15 to 29% when tested prior to bariatric surgery. So in the studies that they're citing here, patients that were morbidly obese going in to have bariatric surgery or stomach stapling or bypass, when they measured them going in pre-surgically, uh, thiamine deficiency was present in 15 to 29 percent depending on the measurement. You can see here after surgery the rate of thiamine deficiency climbs and with it an increasing risk of something called Wernicke's encephalopathy which is a neurological damage that causes as a result of thiamine deficiency. So first, first it's important to understand that people going in for bariatric surgery are obese. That's why they're going in. Many of them, up to a third, are deficient in thiamine, and the deficiency progressively worsens after the surgery because when you, when you bypass the stomach, you're affecting digestion and absorption. You're affecting digestion and absorption of thiamine. And you can see here 42% of the U.S. population was considered obese, and this is a statistic from 2018. That number is actually higher today. Um, and 39% of the adult population worldwide is considered overweight or obese. We're talking about the mechanism of just the fact of somebody being overweight or obese and being more at risk for thiamine deficiency. Um, if, you, if you come down here and look at diabetes, for individuals with type 1 or 2, so whether you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, plasma thiamine was estimated to be approximately 76% lower than in non-diabetic controls. That's a tremendous difference. Um, and so we ask why. Why do diabetics have such lower levels of thiamine than non-diabetics? Um, you can see here in another study, frank deficiency was found in 98% of the study population using plasma and urine samples. Um, they go on to say the mechanisms involved uh, in hypo hyperglycemia are too high, high blood sugar driven impaired uptake in the kidneys. So there's an impaired uptake of thiamine along with an increased clearance. Um, but there's a few other things that I think that are important to bring up here with diabetics and the diabetic population. And one of them has to do with medication use. Now, diabetics commonly get put on a drug called metformin. And recent research studies show that metformin blocks vitamin B1 uptake in the intestines. So if you're diabetic, we see diabetic levels much lower than non-diabetic levels. It, it's very potentially possible beyond just the high blood sugar creating a problem with uptake. Metformin, the drug used to treat diabetes, blocks the uptake into your intestines and, or from your intestines uh, into your bloodstream. So we also know in the same kind of realm of, of ideas understand that um, high carbohydrate diets play a major role here. 
as you can see, perhaps the most commonly disregarded factor when considering thiamine status is the consumption of the individual's diet. High carbohydrate diets effectively decrease circulating thiamine concentrations by a number of mechanisms. So not just one way, but many ways. You see here, metabolizing carbohydrates regardless of their source or quality. So, you know, we make this claim that it could be even a good carbohydrate, a piece of fruit or a vegetables, regardless of their source. Very important to make that distinction. Carbohydrate overconsumption diminishes thiamine stores in the body. One study found that when 55% of total caloric intake came from carbs, no matter their source, again, it doesn't matter what kind of carbs, thiamine status in otherwise healthy and, th and thiamine sufficient individuals declined. Now, I've talked about this often where, you know, it's, the question comes up a lot, well, what should I eat and how should I eat? I've talked about this rule of thirds. Nature generally presents itself with balance, not with imbalance. And so I think part of the problem in our society, especially in the U.S., is we try to solve imbalance with more imbalance. So like an example of this would be we try to solve diabetic diets with ketogenic diets. So patients eating carbohydrates, 70% of their total calories coming from carbs, the antidote becomes a ketogenic diet where they're not eating, where they're eating hardly any carbs, right? And so they, they bounce from one imbalanced diet to another imbalanced diet. But this is why I like to start people with the presumption of balance Carbs, fats, and protein. A third, a third, a third, give or take. Um, again, in this, you can see in this, in this review, research has shown that when your carbohydrate level goes over 55% of your total caloric intake, no matter the source of the carb, the thiamine status will actually decline. As carbohydrate intake increased, thiamine decreased further. In contrast, lower carbohydrate or higher fat diet slows thiamine loss and thiamine restricted experimental conditions. So while protein seems to preserve thiamine. So what do we, what do we see in the modern American diet? And this is one of the reasons why I think, uh, why I think it's, this is such a prevalent deficiency. I see this deficiency probably 20, 30% of the patients that, that I see in my practice because the average American diet is seventy plus percent carbs. And it's typically low protein and high fat. And the fat that's being consumed is predominantly seed oils. And so in from processed uh, mechanisms, and so you have this super high inflammatory seed oil diet providing massive amounts of omega-6. You have an abundance of carbohydrates. Again, this is definitely going to deplete not not even just vitamin B1. It depletes all of your B vitamins because they're required for your. Any time you increase your carbohydrate load, you have to understand carbohydrates put demand on the status of B vitamins because you need B vitamins to metabolize the carbohydrates, to break them down into their smaller parts so that your body can convert them into energy. So if you're eating a highly, this is especially true of a highly processed carbohydrate diet where heavy carbs are going to deplete your B vitamin status, when you couple that with a higher fat load with excessive seed oils that create an omega-6-3 imbalance that leads to heightened levels of inflammation and low protein. Protein preserves, as we said in the study, protein preserves the degradation of thiamine. So we want balance. We don't, you don't need to be 90% protein either. Don't think that just because protein, because it preserves it, that you need to go crazy in that direction. Don't, don't solve imbalance with more imbalance. Try to come back to balance. Um, but at any rate, I want you to understand high carbohydrate diets definitely have an impact on thiamine status. And so when we ask the question about diabetics, right, we just said that diabetics, for individuals with type 1 or type 2 uh, diabetes, 
76% lower vitamin B1 levels than in non-diabetics, and this is part of the reason why, is that excessive carbohydrate intake, because we know that excessive carbohydrate intake contributes to the development of diabetes. And, and, uh, and so these, these things play together. Now there are other things in our world that will contribute to thiamine deficiency as well. I think it's equally important to, uh, to understand. And one of those is food chemicals. In addition to the carbohydrate load, processed food tends to carry a much higher toxicant load than unprocessed and organic foods. Every aspect of commercial food production involves the usage of chemical products that are toxic to the mitochondria. This is where your energy is made inside your cells. Many of these chemicals used in commercial agriculture through the various channels of processing, preservation, and presentation degrade thiamine and other nutrients when consumed. So, you know, this is why we talk about trying to eat whole real foods that aren't processed, that are in season, that are grown without pesticides and other chemicals, because thiamine is relatively abundant in a, in a healthy diet. It's when you start going the direction of processing and excessive chemical exposure. We also know that alcohol, tobacco, coffee, and tea consumption will impact or affect thiamine status. While chronic alcoholism is a recognized contributor to thiamine deficiency in the form of Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, the role of regular alcohol consumption below the threshold of alcoholism. So if you're that person that drinks a glass of wine a night, this is what we're talking about. The role of thiamine depletion um, below the threshold of alcoholism is underappreciated. Regardless of the amount, the ethanol in alcohol, I think it's important to highlight this, regardless of the amount, the ethanol in alcohol blocks conversion of dietary thiamine into active thiamine. So when you eat thiamine from your food, your body has to convert that thiamine, has to activate it. And alcohol, ethanol blocks that conversion reducing thiamine availability by as much as half, 54%. So that glass of wine every night, you're blocking it every night. Is it simply a matter of, deg of degree relative to chronicity that determines the rate of thiamine depletion? When consumed regularly, alcohol damages the intestinal mucosa. This is another aspect. So when you damage the intestinal mucosa, you result in impaired absorption and dysbiosis. Now, part of what we're learning um, is about dysbiosis is that when you have an imbalanced microbiome, one of the important components to the microbiome, so these are the bacteria that live in your GI tract, but the microbiome helps make B vitamins. And so as we learn more about that role of, you know, of these bacteria, it's important to understand that anything you can do to preserve the integrity of your microbiome has to be a priority in your health. And so alcohol consumption impairs, uh, impairs not only the absorption through damage to the intestine, but also contributes to dysbiosis in the microbiome. We also know nicotine in tobacco products inhibits thiamine availability by antagonizing the thiamine transporter in the pancreatic cells. We were talking earlier about the, thi the, uh, the role that, that vitamin B1 stimulates the pancreas and helps it produce enzymes and insulin. But here you can see nicotine inhibits uptake of thiamine by these cells by 40, greater than 40% and possibly in other tissues as well. This impairs insulin secretion. So when you think about it, you know, you're drinking and you're smoking, you know, you throw a high carbohydrate diet into that mix. It's like a it's like a perfect storm for inhibiting thiamine uptake and a perfect storm for pancreatic damage. We also know that caffeic acid, chlorogenic acid, and tannic acid, these are substances found in coffee and tea, as well as energy drinks for those of you who don't do coffee and tea and think those energy drinks are great. We know that these chemicals oxidize the thiazole ring of the thiamine molecule, impairing its absorption. So drinking heavy amounts 
you know, of coffee or tea or energy drinks will impair thiamine uptake. And then you add that, you know, most people don't just drink coffee plain or tea plain. Energy drinks are loaded with sugars and other chemicals. But you can see while the added sugars, flavors, and other substances to enhance taste increase thiamine demand. And they go on to say 62% of Americans consume an average of three cups of coffee per day. So are you one of those? Is that what you're doing? Are you eating a high carbohydrate diet, drinking excessive quantities of, of coffee, where you're impairing your body's ability not only to uh, absorb thiamine, but you're depleting and overutilizing, you're burning through your thiamine, and so you're at risk. And again, this is a pretty common scenario. Let's talk about one other area that is very common today, and that area uh, is called polypharmacy. So medications is what we're referring to. You see here, after the diet, the next most common threat to thiamine sufficiency is the use of pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals deplete thiamine and other nutrients directly and indirectly by a number of mechanisms. Some of this is by design, as with certain antibiotics that target thiamine, and some of it represents off-target effects, such as the blockade of thiamine transporters. As we mentioned earlier, thiamine transporters are blocked by metformin. And the 146 other drugs that have tested for this action, there was a recent paper published on mechanisms of many, many different classes of drugs creating an, inhib an inhibition of thiamine transporters, and so basically blocking their ability for the intestinal cells to uptake thiamine. We also see among the greatest threats to thiamine status, metformin, psychiatric medications, which are very common in today's world, metronidazole, which is a common antibiotic and antiparasitic um, used, especially if you've been to a, like a, um, out of the country and, and you suspect you've picked up a parasite, a lot of doctors prescribe that drug as an antiparasitic, as well as other antibiotics and hypertensives, or anti-rather hypertensives. You see that also pain medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, acetaminophen, and aspirin. As well, we've got proton pump inhibitors. How many of you have ever taken an antacid, uh, drugs that block stomach acid? We also know that diuretics and chemotherapeutic drugs, so cancer treatment drugs, um, all can contribute to, to thiamine deficiency. They go on to say it should be noted that chronic polypharmacy has become normalized in recent decades. In other words, it's normal for a person to be on five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've seen people on more than 20 medications at a time. That's the standard. As a matter of fact, um, several patients I've seen over the years will come in, and these be people in their 70s, and they'll say, I went to my other doctor, and you know, when they asked me what medicines I was on, I said, I'm not on any. And their doctors just can't believe they're not on medicine. I've even seen people in their 50s where their doctors are like, what do you mean you're not on medicine? You should be on some medicines. It's like, why should we be on medicines? What's the purpose? What's the point if we, if we do it right? So chronic polypharmacy has become norm normalized in recent decades, even though it's, you know, it really is an indicator of terrible health. And so the additive effects of these drugs... Um, on micronutrient depletion is likely significant. So drug-induced nutritional deficiencies, which we've talked about numerous, uh, on numerous occasions as it relates to um, multiple mechanisms.